Call the informal session to order. And, uh, Mr. City Manager, I believe you have... Uh, yes, sir, I do. Item, uh, mem members of Council, welcome back. And uh, so today we've got four City Manager briefings, and we're going to begin with stormwater operations and maintenance. Uh, Mr. Mark Johnson, our Director of Public Works, and Phil Cutter, Acting Operations Engineer, are scheduled to brief. Is that how you're going to run it today, yes, sir. Mark? Okay. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, uh, Mayor Jones, Council Members. Thank you for coming, letting us uh, come here and talk to you about stormwater maintenance. Uh, uh, in past months, we've been here to tell you about the status of the flood control projects. I believe last month we talked to you about uh, the water quality side of the business. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, stormwater maintenance. And with me today, I've got Philip Cutter, Acting Operations Engineer. Cheryl Cole is the Operations Stormwater Engineer. And Mark Jones is the Engineer Head of the Engineering Construction Section. Uh, they are the uh, engineering brains down in operations. So... I want to talk to you about uh, operations and maintenance. Uh, we have three main goals. The three are sustain flood control of the system, uh, protect the uh, water quality of our downstream systems, and maximize the infrastructure lifespan. Uh, we always achieve, try to achieve moving the organization from being a reactive organization to being more proactive. And I'll give you a quick example of that. Uh, we experience a lot of cave-ins on the pipe system throughout the year. Uh, we are extremely reactive to that, and there's more cave-ins out there than we can react to. Yeah. Would you make a seat, please, Mr. Come Jones? In. Thank you. Come on in. Welcome. Okay. Uh, we employ a, a systems approach uh, because we have to progressively maintain, clean all parts of the system. We cannot just focus on one part like pipes and neglect ditches. Uh, we cannot just focus on lakes and neglect, neglect pump stations. So it's a systems approach. Uh, for this year, the operating budget is $22.1 million. In addition, we have $16.4 million in the CIP. This pie chart right here will sh shows you the overall stormwater operating budget for this year. It's $42.4 million. You can clearly see operations and maintenance is the largest at 2.1, followed by, by uh, transfers. That's $8 million transferred to the CIP, uh, along with about $900,000 going to uh, our share of sending out the, st the stormwater uh, bills. Uh, flood control is at 3.2 million, uh, debt service is at 3.9, and stormwater quality is at 1.4. If we want to drill down even further into the 2.2, the 13.68 is operations and maintenance. If you think about it, that's the truck shovels and men that you see running around the city. Uh, mosquito control, we all know what that is, at 2.61. Mark Jones oversees the uh, 1.94 in construction and engineering. He's the engineers that are primarily doing contra uh, contract management with respect to the CIP projects. Inspections and spills is the BMP, BMP inspection team and spill response group, and then followed up by 2.9 million for street sweeping throughout the city. To take a quick look at the stormwater CIP, we've always split it into three groups. Uh, this past year, uh, flood control exceeded operations and maintenance at 2.31. Then you have operations and maintenance at 16.4, followed by stormwater quality at 8.6. If you look at the operations and maintenance CIP, to go down from the top, the first two are severe repetitive loss projects. The third project, Canal Management Phase 1, we created that project this year for this budget. We put in some seed money of 500000 recognizing that we have canal systems out there that we need to maintain. And the idea is uh, through each, each year of the six-year program, find some money, get it, plug it in there. So hopefully we'll accumulate about $2 million to start doing some actual maintenance on the canal systems. Lake management, I think we're all familiar with that. We're dredging lakes. Uh, we are repairing outfall, uh, uh, lake outfall systems, intake systems, uh, oceanfront, 
uh, stormwater facilities. That's maintenance of the hurricane protection project, which we are obligated to perform. Primary systems infrastructure, that is pretty much uh, assisting the off-road ditch maintenance program. Residential drainage cost participation, uh, that has grown into the lake management, algae control, uh, aquatic vegetation control cost participation effort. Again, another severe repetitive loss pro project. Stormwater pump station modifications, that goes to maintaining our 15 pump stations throughout the city. And then another big one is the stormwater infrastructure rehab, which is basically a uh, similar to the public utilities fix and find uh, program where we go into neighborhoods and Philip Cutter will give you more detail on that. And we go through a process to identify deep defects within the drainage system of the community and we affect those repairs to reduce the probability of failure in the future. These are the 11 sub maintenance programs that we carry on. Uh, I'll pass the baton over to Philip Cutter right now who will run through these 11 programs. Philip. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. Appreciate you all uh, allowing us to come and present this to you again today. What Mark talked about was the system-wide approach. Uh, what I'm going to go through is uh, each one of these programs and just give you a brief overview of those. Uh, the pipe systems, that's uh, kind of like the uh, arteries that, uh, that carry our blood and the stormwater throughout the city. We have over 1,100 miles of stormwater pipe and over 4, 43,500 uh, stormwater inlets throughout the city that we have to maintain. Uh, currently, we do that with a staff of about 42 FTEs in our, in our uh, operating facility. Um, and we do that on a cycle of approximately 90 years. Uh, what we'd like to get down to is about a 15-year cycle. And you'll see here, we're thinking right now we're projecting that would take us about another $8.5 million in our neighborhood and pipe system rehabilitation program. Again, this is just one piece of the pie. And this works along in conjunction with uh, what we use as our indicator, and our indicators are cave-ins. What we do is we monitor our calls that we get in from the public, and we utilize those as a primary indicator for problems in a neighborhood. It's only one of the, one of the uh, indicators we use. We also use flood control or flood calls in those neighborhoods also. Um, right now, we have a backlog of approximately 800 cave-ins in the city. Uh, we average in-house and with our contractor repairing about 100 of those a month. We'd like to get that down to about a two-month backlog. So what, we're, think what uh, we're projecting is we need about $9 million to attack the 600 additional backlog of cave-ins that we have throughout the city. Now, with that, we'd probably look at stretching that over one to two years. We don't want to, you know, stretch that over a 15-year cycle because all of these are failures to the system that need to be addressed as soon as possible, and we are doing that currently. <clears throat> like I said, we do use this as a primary indicator. So what we do is we track that. Uh, this is a, a, a relative to the old brown map, for any of you that uh, recall the, the map that we used to present a few years back. And what this does is it looks at the cave-ins from particular neighborhoods around the city. And what we do is we review the maintenance records and look at that as our primary indicator so we can locate an ID work in an area. When we do that, we go in and we use our GIS uh, crews to map the, the neighborhood as best as we can. And then we turn over that database to our contractor who will utilize that to go out and CCTV or clean the entire system and then CCTV it. The contractor then returns that database back to us and we upgrade, upload that into our GIS system to update our mapping. Uh, a lot of this piping is old. Uh, we may not have accurate sizes and, and material types on some of that. So this is a good way to uh, facilitate uh, upgrading our asset, inf our infrastructure assets. Once we finish that, we uh, review those inspection results and then we coordinate with our stormwater modeling group to see if there are any areas where the modeling indicates that a pipe is very undersized so that we can go back 
and if we can incorporate a upsize of a pipe in, con in coordination with our rehabilitation efforts, we will try to do that. And then we will utilize that to develop the repair plans. And then we'll go ahead and schedule and, and do the repairs. Now, what we started doing this year, uh, earlier this year, is what Mark did was, uh, Mark Jones, it is, he wanted to look at how are we doing? So he, he look, devised a, a, a process where he looked at all the neighborhoods that we had already uh, completed, which are the ones on your, in your left-hand column over here. Let's see here, which one is it? At the far left column. And he looked at those, and you can see they were completed anywhere from 2014 with Aragona Villa, or 2012 with Princess Anne Plaza, up to as recent as Magic Hollow was completed earlier this year. The, the second and third column indicate the percentage of flood calls that we've received on an annual uh, yearly average pre and post repair. So take Aragona Village, for example, the average before or the average number of flood calls following, uh, following our rehab was 76% less than it was before. So we feel that pretty good that we did some, some good work there. Un unfortunately, the cave-in calls are only 7% less. Well, that's kind of to be expected. Aragona is an extremely old neighborhood. Uh, we're not surprised that we continue to get failures in that system because when we do the, the neighborhood rehab, it's not a complete replacement. It's, it's basically repairing the areas that have failed, the worst areas that have failed. So there's other areas that we're not aware of that show themselves, and that's what I think we're seeing there. So the majorities of these are greater than, or the negative ones are greater than 50, and that's what we determined we wanted to use as an indicator. If it was over 50, we felt like we were doing a good job. Any of the ones that are under 50, we wanted to go back and evaluate and figure out what the issue was, similar to with Aragona. Uh, Princess Anne Plaza, again, another older neighborhood that uh, had, had concerns. Uh, there are two down at the bottom in Strawbridge and Pine Ridge that are the 13% the for Pine Ridge and 4% for Strawbridge. Those were done about the same time as we uh, in, in following Matthew, Hurricane Matthew. And then this year also with Florence and Michael and the storms that we had, we had uh, some indications where we had some blockages in the, in the neighborhood. We had problems with uh, the rainstorms or the hurricanes coming immediately or there, shortly thereafter trash day. So there were reports of uh, grass bags blocking inlets. Uh, I know I got a report from one neighbor who said once he removed the grass bags, so the drainage went down very well. So, you know, that, we think those are some of the indications, but we're going to continue to track that. Going on to uh, lakes and ponds, right now the city, in the city we have 448 wet ponds that we're responsible to, to, to do the maintenance on and 38 dams and spillways. Um, this is primarily the lake dredging program. Um, we're currently on about a 95 year cycle. I know in the past we've uh, said we had uh, you know, a lot more money to get down to the 50 year cycle. Right now we're, we've looked at this program and some of our other programs. We think with a, a $2.3 million increase we can move forward and progress this program a lot quicker, get into uh, a schedule of about 10 lakes per year. And we think that would uh, really uh, benefit us. Now on the dams and spillways, Right now, these 38, we're in negotiations with uh, DCR on nine of those uh, for determination on what the hazard, if they're going to be uh, classified as hazardous dams, and if we need to do further investigation on those. Next part of that is what Mark had mentioned with the canals. What we have done, and, and this is just the, the, the start of this particular program, We've identified 61 canals throughout the city. You'll see the, the numbers here. Now, this is not a rating of, of worst or best. This is just a listing to an account number on them. So with the $500,000, we're starting to do some, some uh, investigation and studying. We started to do some permitting on a couple of these, uh, specifically number uh, 13, which is <coughs> Castle Street Ditch, and number 32, Linhaven Drive, where we're hoping to get some permitting and, and do some uh, 
do some maintenance on those next year. We're also using some of that $500,000 to address some of the issues that we had on canal number two, which is a, a federal project which gets inspected on a uh, biannual basis by the Corps of Engineers and we're responsible to make those repairs. Next we have is our off-road ditch program. We have 152 miles in our off-road ditch program that we started back in FY14 where we wanted to address and try to get down to an eight-year cycle. Currently we're on approximately a 12-year cycle. Uh, we think uh, with another $5.9 million injected into that, we could get down to that eight-year cycle. Uh, we currently have uh, three crews or three uh, supervisors that run the off-road ditch crews and one on the roadside ditch. And depending on the extent of the work that's needed, they can handle one or two ditches. They can split between them. Uh, just a side note on that, as you'll see, and we've talked about before, there are eight, uh, eight or 16 zones, eight in the south and eight in the north. We do one in the south every year. <laughs> Primary reason for that is out of the 152 miles, about 109 miles of that are in the county, which is probably information, good information to know. On the pump stations, we have 15 pump stations currently in the city. Uh, we operate and maintain. Uh, the good news is on this one is we think right now with the current level of, of uh, pump stations that we have, we're funded adequately to maintain those. However, we're also, there are a lot of talks of flood control and new projects on the horizon, so uh, we will be uh, revisiting that in the future as we uh, look to uh, add new pump stations in some of the, uh, the troubled spots throughout the city. Beach Erosion and Hurricane Protection Project. This is, a, like Mark said, is a federal project. Uh, we get inspected on this project every year by the, the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, we need to maintain an acceptable rating when we get that inspection so that we don't jeopardize our federal funding from, and uh, FEMA reimbursements following uh, natural disasters. With that, um, it, what we have to do is we try to maintain a five-year cycle on that. But with the Corps of Engineers, when they do that inspection, if, if they uh, note a deficiency in their inspection, we have two years to do that repair. So what we're looking at right now is we need another $350,000 to ensure that we uh, can make all those repairs. And the, the trouble with the, the work down there is it's such a harsh environment down on the ocean front with the, uh, the wind and the sand blowing all the time. And unfortunately, our window for doing those repairs keeps getting shorter and shorter all the time with uh, the longer tourist season and uh, the additional special events that we have to uh, operate around because we don't want to impact any of those. Next up is our street sweeping. Uh, currently, we have five FTEs assigned to that. Uh, we do some sweeping in-house at the town center and the oceanfront, and then special, by special request on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, additionally, a couple years ago, we started a uh, contract street sweeping program. We fund that at $2.25 million. Uh, their cycle is to uh, address the street, to sweep, that's on a mouthful, to sweep each street six times per year. Uh, right now, uh, we're uh, continuing to follow up behind them. Uh, it's a new program. We're, we're talking closely uh, with the contractors so we can maintain that. Uh, when we take and uh, get that uh, spoils, we, we do test those quarterly with the water quality group. And again, this is something that goes toward our MS4 program. So this is a, a benefit for us all. Inspections and spills. Um, all of the public BMPs are required to be inspected on a yearly basis. So the 400 plus BMPs that we have, we have to inspect those every year, uh, or 717, I'm sorry, the 414, the 400 are the, uh, the wet ponds. The additional difference up to the 717 include other stormwater management facilities throughout the city that are not uh, wet ponds. The uh, private BMPs were required to inspect on a once every five years or do 20% each year. And again, this is a MS4 requirement also. What you see here is a couple of uh, uh, one of the new programs or a new uh, funding request we have, we, we need. Uh, of the other stormwater management facilities that are not part of the, uh, the dredging program, 
We have approximately 269 of those. When we do the inspections every year, they note deficiencies on the outfalls. Uh, the the uh, picture on the left is a uh, adequately functioning BMP. The one on the right needs some uh, to address some uh, some uh, standing water and ponding issues and uh, mowing and, and a little bit of erosion. But right now we don't have an adequate funding so or a funding source to address those to address items such as mowing, grading, and outfall maintenance. And we're requesting or we're going to be looking at need. We have the need for approximately one point two million dollars for that program. Additionally, mosquito control, we do uh, uh, 35 FTEs at $2.4 million here. Um, they just finished doing the spraying for this season, uh, this the past week. As the temperatures go down, we're, we're finally out of the, the spraying season. So they will be entering their ditch uh, maintenance season now. Uh, the mosquito control folks and during their off season will do ditch maintenance on ditches that run in backyards, uh, primarily are private systems that hold water that are mosquito breeding areas. So they'll do that to help uh, address mosquito response. Now one of the things Mark had mentioned earlier is we're wanting to go from more from a, a responsive to a proactive. Well this is one of the ones where we're wanting to be more responsive. We do responsive spraying on this so that we don't waste our chemicals. We, we track uh, or we trap mosquitoes and we address when or spraying where, where the mosquitoes are. Now just to uh, summarize some of the accomplishments uh, from all these systems that we talked about in the programs. The pipe systems, uh, since July 1 of 2017, we've cleaned over 204,000 linear feet of pipe, which is over 38 miles of piping. We've uh, completed the neighborhood rehab on uh, one subdivision, Magic Hollow. We've done uh, drainage improvements at six other areas that include uh, Green Run Bike Path, uh, Holly Farm, Shoreline Independence uh, Stabilization, Downsire Chase Outfall, and Prince Sand Enterprise Facility. Uh, we also did uh, some upgrades to our wash rack at the operations yard where we wash our larger facilities to make sure that we can contain the storm, the runoff from that washing so it doesn't have, uh, we're not allowed by state law to drain that directly into the storm drainage system. So we had to do some improvements there. For lakes and ponds, we completed six lakes, which included Green Run 4, Green Run 5, Brookside, Center Point 1 and 2, and Windsor Oak West number two. Um, with that, we've removed over 57,000 cubic yards of dredge spoils from those particular lakes. We've also, as part of the, uh, the cost participation program, we had treated algae in, in two of the lakes uh, and uh, did some improvements at our uh, Whitehurst disposal site. For ditch systems, we had six ditches and culvert improvement projects. They included Community Canal, which is some of the ones that you saw in the quarter of the update, Mill Landing and Nanny Creek, Land of Promise, Niter Ditch, Balio Drive, and Town Center Ditch. Uh, going back to the pump stations, we had the 16th Street Stormwater Pump Station improvements. Uh, we installed SCADA, Supervisory Control Alarm and Data Acquisition, at all of our stormwater pump stations so we can remotely monitoring those stations so we don't have to send somebody out there uh, to check each one of them pre-storm even though we, we still monitor and make sure of all that. I think Mr. Wood has oh, a question at the end. At the end. Okay. Okay. He'll, he'll wait till the end. Okay. Um, then we also did some electrical upgrades on four of the pump stations. Um, and we are, have a major pump station uh, over off Shore Drive. <coughs> Our Ocean Park pump station number two is under uh, rehab. I think we have a uh, pre-construction pre meeting coming up here soon. Uh, federal projects, uh, which we had highlighted, uh, did 31 stair nosings and replaced 70 boardwalk repairs that were completed at 1.5 million. Um, the street sweeping, uh, we had said we wanted to do six cycles per year. We have completed 11 cycles since July 1 of 17. And just to note, we'd rece we've removed 46.5 thousand cubic yards of debris from street sweeping. Just to note that as compared to the amount of material that we removed during our dredging program. Uh, it's a little bit less, but any of that material that gets picked up or taken off the streets is material that's not going to make it to the uh, BMP and we won't have to dredge. So that's definitely a, a positive note there. 
And then on the inspections and spills, we had 163 service requests for, for spills, and we ended up spending about $31,000 in contract support to, to, adjust, to uh, address those issues. And then on the last note, the 839 BMPs inspected. Now just to summarize all the items, just so you have it all on one slide here, uh, again, this is items that we had talked about on the pipe cleaning, additional funding, and the cycles that we were looking to get to, uh, trying to get to a 15-year cycle with the neighborhood infrastructure and the pipe cleaning, uh, reduce our cave-in backlog down from an eight-month backlog to do the repair to a two-month backlog, uh, reduce our late dredging down from 95 years to 50 years, get the canal program in place with a 25-year cycle, and get our ditches down to that eight-year cycle we were, were targeting, uh, and the beach erosion and the BMP maintenance down to a 20-year cycle. With that, uh, you can see the, the numbers on that particular one. Just to wrap up, uh, again, like I said, we wanted to do a system-wide approach, but we also wanted to be proactive on our maintenance efforts, and that's what we're really pushing throughout the organization is to be more proactive, try to look for the problems and fix them before they get reported. Also, we want to reduce our backlog and our maintenance cycles, and then expand our canal maintenance and our BMP maintenance following those inspections. Mr. Wood. Okay, that. Thanks. Um, okay, Mr. So, Wood. So two questions. The first one, back on slide 11, you were talking about the trash bags clogging up um, drainage and things like that, and I remember yes. there, was, there was an issue, I think, during one of the storms, there was like basketball or something wedged in oh, one of the drains and yes, things. Sir. Um, it kind of goes back to an issue where we've got a, um, so there's there's an erosion sediment control requirement that, that I guess DCR puts on right. uh, people building stuff to put in gutter protection, and, and when they do that, that effectively stops <clears throat> the, the, the drainage from going down, but they, they want that in there, but obviously we don't want that because that, that gutter protection very clearly mm -hmm. uh, on a project of any size is going to back up a street. Right, and it's, it's, it's so I don't know if there's if there's a way that we can kind of get those two entities to talk to each other because I understand that the the, the desire to to do good erosion and sediment control, but ultimately we, we need to protect people's property as right. opposed to worrying about as, as much mud. So that that's the one question. I don't know if you have. Yeah, to I'll I'll just add. Yeah, contractors are supposed to be responsible for their work sites and mm -hmm. be aware of the weather that their work sites experience. And if they have to, to prevent a flood, pull some of those uh, those ENS uh, the <laughs> socks, gutter, gutter buddies. buddies. That's what you call <laughs> yeah. uh, away from away from the uh, inlets. Go ahead and do it, and then put them back right after the storm event. I will tell you when uh, we get the call, and uh, our guy goes out there and he sees one, and it's causing a problem. We'll pull it off and we'll put it on top of the inlet and we'll notify the contractor the next day. Yeah, so that, that was the one question. And, and it'd be nice if maybe that could work a little bit better because I know in theory that that's a good idea. But but in practice, there, there is a requirement and and the contractor's kind of in trouble if he pulls it out because you know, the ENS regulations say you will not pull it out and then you say that. So I'm um, going to lakes and ponds. One, one of the things, and I don't know, Mr. Hansen, can address you know, one of the ideas that I'd floated at one of the retreats was was the SSD idea similar to to the neighborhood dredging program so that we could we could take a look at some of these these privately owned ponds and see if there's a method whereby the city could actually engage in dredging if if these folks wanted to to do a system like that and can you give me an idea of where we are on all that no I yes, I'd seen a couple emails going back and forth saying there was some we, we, we've developed a uh, program, modeled it after the uh, dredging SSDs, and right now we're working on some cost scenarios. I will tell you one of the big issues is who, who gets to participate. Is it just the lake owners around the, the edge of the lake, or is it everybody within the drainage area that drains into the lake? Uh, so when you look at that, uh, you, we're, we know we're going to run into some, some discussion on uh, who should really bear the cost or be willing to bear the cost. And I think it also depends upon if it's for aesthetic reasons or if it's for drainage reasons. Because Correct. a lot of times we have folks that are just upset with the, the overgrowth of, of algae and things like that on there that, that may or may not impact the actual drainage, but it just doesn't look as nice. And that's why we created the, uh, the program. 
uh, to assist assist uh, homeowners associations and lake owners associations. They can only do that one time, right? Uh, the idea is to get them kick-started yeah. and get them to develop their own program, and they follow through on that. And I think that that's where that's kind of falling apart, so they didn't do it. But, I mean, I, I'd be interested to just get an update when we could on, on where we are on that. We'll, we'll get that for you. Thank you. Just, uh, I would just mention uh, we cannot forget our episode of Lake Trant. Oh, yeah. And... Oh, yeah. You know, this whole perception oh, of like lake that. dredging, the aesthetic versus the true value of creating a flow for stormwater so that you do have the siltation dropping out, which takes the nitrogen uh, filled particles out. So, And, and that, that's, that's why I, I mentioned this to do this similar to the SSD because there's the, the neighborhood dredging SSD because there's no real... You know, drainage necessity to to dredge navigable waterways, but it's something that that the property owners gain a benefit from. So if if there's a method whereby we can do that for for lakefront owners, and and actually pick up a little bit of drainage ability, I think I think that's a win-win. And I just like to see where we are. Uh, on that. And we agree with that. Thank you, you know, Ms. Wilson. Um, gotcha. I'll bring up something. A couple years ago, and I know John's gonna. He knows exactly. <laughs> I know what you're gonna say. You know exactly what <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna board. say. This is really great, and I think we should do that. But I think we still there's some things out of the box, thinking that we we really ought to be doing in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Like when they built a basketball court, they made it a, a, a pervious surface so that the water went through the court, and it didn't run off, and and it saved lots and lots of money for that. You know, when we're building some of these things, why can't we make <clears throat> our basketball courts and some of these the things that we're doing so that the water is filtered rather than running off and then we're dealing with some of these things. I think there's, and some of our parking lots, that, so they, they can go, they had parking lots that the edges sort of went down and the water would drain in so that they weren't just running off. And we can encourage, you know, some of our developers to be doing some of these things. There's some best practices that we could be doing that I really don't think that we're taking advantage of. Um, and maybe we can give some some tax advantages if people will do those. But I, I just think that we could do some more creativity to what we're we're to what we're doing. And and this is important. And I'm not saying it's not, but I think that there's some things that we could be doing that, that's more than this. And uh, you know, when I was on the Chesapeake Bay Advisory Board for the LGAC, you know, that's where we, we saw some of these things, and it was, it was, it was pretty cool. Um, I think we should do more. I guess the other question that I, I knew John was going to be reading my mind. Um, that's kind of a scary thing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the other thing is, so we've got 20 million and 9 million. Is there plans for, with the budget coming up, to be putting some of the money these needs in the budget? Haven't even started to figure these out. These are optimal <coughs> numbers. These are not real numbers. These are not numbers that are affordable. These are numbers that require a phase in. These are engineers giving you the optimal solution sets. These aren't the financial guys that have to compare what's affordable versus what, uh, what a phase in might be. They're picking 15 years uh, uh, on their first subject, pipe cleaning, and I'll tell you they need 50 years. They don't need 15 years. But these are the engineers providing you a perspective from there. We will take a look at this, and my job is to figure out how to balance what's affordable versus what we essentially need and then figure out the duration of phase-in necessary to meet the requirements that we got. When we start to build some new things, when we're, when we're building courts and tennis courts and the schools are doing things, we really ought to be trying to figure out, moving forward with the new things, how we can affect our stormwater at the same time. Absolutely. Ms. Hanley? Uh, on the canals, uh, slide 13, um, <coughs> there are a lot of them, and you only mentioned two or three that I think we are looking at, and we're only looking at... Uh, thousand of these. Um, this, this, uh, a lot of these are in the southern watershed because I guess the canals are the primary drainage for the southern watershed. The, the additional 900,000 a year that we have in the 
budget now. I guess it's operating money. This was CIP, so that's to be spent in the southern watersheds. Is that all of it, or is that just canals? Is it ditch maintenance, or just how are you looking at that? Uh, actually, actually, the 900000 is in the southern canals uh, CIP project, and uh, there's a little bit of an overlap. Okay. Uh, we, we put... Uh, some of those main canals down in the southern part of the city on this list one so they wouldn't get lost uh, and uh, what we will do is uh, as we march through this list and we coordinate with the southern watershed CIP uh, we will determine uh, which projects are going to get funded out of which CIP uh, so we recognize 900,000 is devoted to the canal systems down there and we're gonna we're gonna work the two CIPs right now. Southern Canals CIP has all the money. This only has five hundred thousand just to get us started. Uh, so we could we could start tracking and planning uh, to address all the canal systems throughout the city. It's certainly important. That, and maybe it's a mistake. Why is there an asterisk after Nanny's Creek? I think that was a cut and paste. Uh, 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 the asterisk just came with it. Okay. I noticed that this afternoon when I was reviewing it. Well, at least you got it spelled right. Thank you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it took me years to make sure I did that. Finished? Yeah. Mr. Boss? On slide 16, this issue only came to light because of the briefing that we got from the folks at Hampton Road to Bridge Tunnel. Uh, but I know that there's new cement formularies that are out. Uh, also, this might be a chance incrementally to, rather than using the pig iron, which we use in reinforcement, to do the drill, do a deeper cut, and use the uh, stainless, because this is a corrosive environment, which is what causes the concrete. I think that's worth looking at to get a longer life out of the repair, especially when it is a repair, because you have more surface area for water seepage, which generally means the repair lasts longer than the uniform intact pavement. So that may, be a, that may be a business case. I love unconstrained engineer estimates. One of my questions was going to be that this understand the data that was behind the years that you picked. You must have had some assumptions you made about sedimentation. I'd love you to share those. I'd love to read those so at least we, the council, will know what risk we're assuming okay. and doing less than what you recommend. But I always like unconstrained estimates. They're always good. And uh, that's all the questions that I had. Thank you very much. All right. Yes. Yes. I have a question about, well, it's slide 17, but it's really in regards to the street sweeping program. Right. The con the contractor that we use, is that an annually renewing contract? What was our... It's a, uh, it's a uh, one-year contract with four additional years you can, you can renew. Okay. And then my other question is, is that the debris, you guys had a debris me measurement. Are you measuring their debris or are we only measuring debris that the cities on our side that we're doing their debris okay okay um, thank you anybody else have any questions can i follow up on that yes because <clears throat> i thought when at one time that you, we, i heard someone say we're no longer getting credit for the actual volume but we're just getting credit for the number of lane miles that we're sweeping so are we actually getting credit for the volume we're we're taking credit uh we're, we're taking credit for the volume, uh, is what we're doing. But it equates to the lane miles that we're sweeping also. Because why I'm asking that, because I know sometimes we do and sometimes we don't sweep up when we grind the pavement. That's not uniformly that we sweep behind that. I know instances where that wasn't done, probably for a reason maybe that wasn't available. But that's a high volume per lane mile. So I'm just curious, making sure that we're, we... I don't believe we're counting that as the sweeping yeah. material. That we're counting with this. The oh wow! Uh, that material, the typically the the dredging con or the uh, milling contractor, the paving contractor sweeps that up and cleans that up a lot. Well, of you might think that's now that you say that happens. I'm just telling you that isn't okay. consistently well, not happened. consistent. But yeah, who gets the credit for? Is my point is it still does the contractor doesn't care about the credit, but that's that is stuff that otherwise would end up <laughs> in the waterways. Right. So do we capture that and take credit for that? That's not inconsequential. Mr. Leahy has a comment right. on that. The reason that number was in there was to show you that what is being trapped by the street sweeping was competitive with what we are dredging out of the lakes right. on the same time frame. Uh, we'd have to get with Melanie Coffee and find out what our MS4 permit is based on whether it is lane miles swept or amount swept up. 
I, I'm not exactly yeah. sure. So I'd love to get the answer. Thanks. But that, the whole purpose of that number in there was just to show you how close it was to what's being dredged and how good what sweep, street sweeping can do for protecting water. Yeah. It's Thank really you, an amount. It's a really an amount that swept up in accordance with the FEMA and D and EPA standards associated with street sweeping. We originally said we'd like to pursue street sweeping. We had conventional street sweepers. The D, uh, EPA took a look at that as part, as well as the oversight committee that the Chesapeake Bay Foundation sits on, and they said, no, you're not meeting the standards by which you collect sediment. The reason why you're collecting sediment is because it has a percentage of phosphorus and a percentage of nitrogen attached to it, and those are the two chemicals they wish to remove from the waterways and give you your credit. But you have to collect it under a certain set of circumstance, a certain process by which this contractor is applying, and then they weigh it and they give you a percentage cut of phosphorus and nitrogen as a reduction. They would not give us that if it was scrapings off uh, asphalt because gotcha. it hasn't had time to accumulate the phosphorus gotcha. and the nitrogen. So we went through a, we thought everybody was all excited to get into it until we figured out we had to put a whole bunch more into it, and that's why this street sweeping contract's a little bit more expensive. Right, but we are much. refining it every year to get better and be more productive with it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. We Thanks, guys. Here. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. All right. Uh, we're going to do a swap out. And next, uh, I've got uh, the Director of Housing and Neighborhood Preservation, Andy Friedman. He's going to come in and talk a little bit about homelessness intervention in selected cities. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. Um, Mr. Mayor, members of council, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, we have some good news and some good information for you. I just want to point out with me today is the person who did the research for this report, our, our intern who is a UVA graduate student, Elizabeth Spach. There's Elizabeth and her supervisor, Cindy Walters, and Ruthie Hill, the administrator of the Housing Resource Center. So we're gonna to talk to you about research we had um, that Elizabeth did for us based on a question Mr. Moss had asked and, and my worry that we wanted to avoid the problems of other cities as far as why do we have so many homeless people in some cities. So we asked Elizabeth to look into that. What we did was look at both some cities that are doing well and some that are not doing so well. Um, we've seen certainly, you just have to read the papers to see what's happening, especially on the West Coast. And, uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Seattle, where they have very significant problems, and we're going to talk about that. <clears throat> Nationally, homelessness has been on a decrease since 2010, except in the last year, from 2016 to 2017. And we think most of that increase is due to those three cities' problems. So here's some trends by locality. Um, it, we count homeless persons per 10,000 people, and on the left you see New York City, Los Angeles, and Seattle, all with uh, increasing levels of homelessness and very high numbers, um, including um, 88, 89 people for uh, New York. And then on the right you see cities with decreasing levels of homelessness, which includes us. We are the blue line at the bottom of the scale, only about eight people per 10,000. Uh, persons. So what we wanted to do, as I said, is to better understand why some communities are experiencing crisis levels of homelessness and, and how we're doing and how we can hopefully avoid that. But I do have to give you the major caveat is we have not done a causal analysis and we cannot say X causes this decrease or X causes this increase. We're looking at factors in the environment and trying to understand um, what might might be true. Uh, Elizabeth looked at newspapers and studies. She looked at point in time counts, which are really good because they're standardized across the country and census data. And we picked uh, localities that are struggling and some that are doing really well. So Seattle, Washington had a 30% increase in homelessness over three years. Um, and most of those homeless are unsheltered. They're having a terrible problem with people everywhere in Seattle. Um, and they're mostly single adults. And um, so what happened with Seattle? Uh, well, let's go to Los Angeles. And they had a 40% increase 
<laughs> and a lot, most of those are unsheltered as well. And chronic homelessness increased a lot. And New York City has grown steadily to over 75,000 homeless persons. And however, they are mostly sheltered because New York City has a right to shelter law. So that has its good, good and bad parts. The right to shelter law is something I hope we never pass in Virginia Beach because it invites people to move here and take, get sheltered. Um, we think some of the factors that contribute to rising homelessness could be, uh, in fact, rising rents um, and rents that are not in relationship to rise to incomes. Um, it's not very super clear in Los Angeles. Um, we also think that um, where your money goes is really important. These shelter, these cities have mostly put their money into temporary shelter. And it's important to understand that when you shelter someone, they're still considered homeless. They don't have a home, they're just in a shelter. And so you're spending all your money not getting them out of homelessness. And so as you see these expenditures on the left side of both of those charts, those are expenditures for shelter that don't get people out of homelessness. Um, we also see that there are problems in utilizing the resources that you have, both in Los Angeles on both their emergency shelter and temporary housing. The light blue area on the graph is unutilized capacity to take care of people where they're not doing that. So um, it's important to have a system that works well that gets people using the capacity that you actually have. However, there's also some cities that have apparently done a great job. Charlotte, North Carolina decreased <clears throat> their homeless population by almost 50%. 85% of them were sheltered and they decreased, they increased the amount of permanent housing. And as we know, and what we practice here is permanent housing is the solution to homelessness. People are housed, they're not continuously maintained in a public system. Um, New Orleans uh, decreased shelter dramatically, um, and they did the largest ex reduction in chronic homelessness. And Houston, Texas decreased its population by 60% in six years. They adopted a coordinated entry system, which we have here, and so they're doing really well. And Atlanta also decreased its homeless population by 50%. They also increased the amount of permanent housing units. And here's us. So our homeless population has actually decreased by 30% since 2010. 75% of our homeless population is sheltered. And as I showed you before, we have the lowest homelessness rate per 10,000 population out of all the cities we studied. So what do we think? And as I said, these are not causes, but these are hopefully um, information that we can continue using. Number one is a coordinated, effective system of intake and assessment that takes people, assesses them accurately, and refers them to the right place and uses all the capacity available in the system. And I can tell you that for several years now, we've been doing that in Virginia Beach. We have a coordinated entry system, which all providers utilize. We get people placed. We have meetings weekly to get people placed into available facilities. And this is our system, and it looks complicated, but basically you have sanctioned the use of the Beach Community Partnership and its governing board, where resources are proposed to be used for certain things based on actual information about what our needs are in the system. And we uh, engage with all stakeholders in the Beach Partnership. And as you know, we've worked very closely with our regional partners to build 400 units of affordable housing throughout the region, which has made a big dent in our chronic homelessness. We do coordinate our assessment. We have a regional crisis hotline where you call. We have the triage assessment. And also, we now have, with your help, uh, a prevention and diversion system that keeps people out of homelessness. And then we have our new resources, both at the Housing Resource Center and throughout the community. We do use data, and um, we're using it ever more 
to make sure we understand what is actually happening. And that's one of the keys that Charlotte has used and New Orleans. And we're trying to get as good as we can to uh, understand exactly what's happening and take action to address it. Um, in the community of one plan, which you adopted a year ago, um, we showed you information about what our community was like and what our needs are and how we analyze it. And um, so we also think that high rents and housing demand, certainly high rents can have an impact on, on homelessness. In Seattle, median rent is growing 50% faster than median incomes. Uh, New York City has an affordable housing shortage. However, New Orleans created a lot more affordable housing and they're doing very well. So here's an illustration of where we sit among some of the cities uh, studied. We have a relatively high median household income and our median rent is somewhat high, it's not the highest. So we, these are one of the, some of the things we need to keep an eye on to see if we're getting way out of balance or not. It certainly doesn't appear that way at this time. So we think uh, our key understandings are regional coordination, involvement of all our stakeholders, certainly local government support, which you have provided. We need to measure what's actually happening. That is, are people getting housed and are they staying housed and evaluating all the data? And we have to watch what happens. Prosperity has two-sided sword. If there's too many people with high incomes, rents go up and housing shortages ensue and you have to be prepared to address that. And now I want to give you a couple of pieces of good news. Um, a recent study came out and we are number one in the country as far as the fewest homeless veterans per veteran population. So we should be really proud about that. We also um, wanted to give you a short uh, kind of preview of our upcoming Housing Resource Center uh, statistics. We um, have data here for the first 18 days that we are open in September. We're housing eight families, 58 people received day support services, 41 people uh, were sh sheltered in the single shelter, eight in the apartments. We helped 21, 20 people either avoid homelessness, probably avoid homelessness, and we also work closely with human services, made referrals to them and they serve people. And 32 people were seen at no cost to the city in the health center. So um, we'd be happy to answer your questions and hear your comments on our report. And I just want to again thank Elizabeth for the work she did. Andy. Yes, uh, sir. One of the things that stood out here is that is the cities who have the best results are, are providing a lot, a, a lot more housing. How right. are they doing that and how are they financing it? So I don't have that information today, but um, that's something we need to look at how much they're doing and how they are, they are doing it. Yes, John. I do research myself. I know LA did a billion dollar uh, referendum for homelessness. Right. They spent a lot of money and built a lot of shelters and yeah. permanent housing. And still, there's a lot of issues there to understand LA, just like San Diego, which is more like us because it's a Navy town. Right. So they suffer from the impact of housing allowances and all those things driving their market. So hopefully we'll look at that. But I was going to mention this under council concern, but this is a good data point. This comes from the Social Security raise and eliminating the taxable earnings base, but it's real wage trends. This is a Congressional Research Office study, which probably people might be familiar with, but it gets back to the, 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 the ugly side of job growth and income growth, because it hasn't been uniformed. The cumulative growth in real wages, this is from 1979 to 2017, was 34.3% in real terms for the 90th percentile, that's the top 10% of wage earners, for the 50th percentile, it was only 6.1%. And for the bottom 10%, which I'm sure is not clear, it was 1.2%. So I don't think anyone can really understand the disconnect <coughs> of why the housing situation in some of these places, because those have seen some of the higher concentration of tech jobs and some of the a higher volume than just 10% of their demographics is in those fields. The supply hasn't increased. And the prices have just gone up. So you have to really know 
So this is the key of why so many people talk about they're financially stressed, which will influence our own budget, because real income growth has not been very well distributed. And in fact, it's been very punishing for over 50% of households. And so I do think that's an underlying issue, especially when I travel out and see Seattle and I see LA and I see San Diego, you see those housing prices. And one of the initiatives that they had in LA, they were letting people build or getting them to build homes in the back of their yards where they could and getting tax incentives to provide housing for the homeless on their property. Right. Like we would think of a in-law house. Yeah. They're looking at building houses for the homeless on existing lots within the city to meet the housing need kind of, and giving people not taxing their property and other incentives to create housing because land is scarce and vertical is very expensive, four or $500 a square foot higher where you have seismic conditions and they can't compensate market incentives to create much affordable housing. So I think it's a big challenge. Mr. Mayor, you're right. It is a housing, but it's also tied to the income of the workforce is a big contributor to what the problem, and that's hard for local governments to solve. Right. All right, anybody else? Yes, Ms. The first when you indicated that there were 20 during that 18 days of preventing homelessness or diverting, then that would have to mean that you were counseling them in some fashion or helping them find a place to live. Is that, you know, that's just, I know you don't have all these answers today because y'all haven't been doing this at that center very long, but I think that's going to be a really important piece that we watch out of what you're doing over there and how that's happening and you're able to, to do that. Yes, ma'am. So um, with council's approval in the budget, we created a, a, that program that starts with discussing with the person what are all the possible options you have to avoid homelessness. And then if you need some financial assistance to get one of those options, we'll try to find that for you or provide it. Because the most cost effective way to not be is to not ever become homeless. And that's, so that's a really important part of the system. So then perhaps uh, having them have some access to some funds to keep them from being evicted from their house. Correct, exactly. Things like that. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wills. This is a really great report. Thank you for all your hard work. Um, and I truly mean that our Housing Resource Center is, I'm really proud of that is one of the greatest things I think we've done since I've been on the council. And um, could you quickly just tell us how it's how it's doing? Sure, um, Ruthie, you want to come up and help me? But um, we opened on September 12th. We've um, all aspects of the building are functioning. All of our contractors are in place. Um, we have always in anything new and un, undone before. There are technical difficulties. We're working through those. We successfully sheltered people during the hurricanes in place, and that was a great accomplishment. And um, we hope to come, we will come back to you in January with kind of a comprehensive report of the first quarter of operations. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add anything? Um, I just found out um, today that um, the fourth family member has moved out of the interim housing unit into housing. So. Uh, this is now the fourth family that successfully moved since September 12th into housing. Um, and each of them have had multiple barriers to, how to, to compensate for to get them into housing. And so it's quite successful. We have served 57 people in the medical uh, clinic and they've all come through our program at the HRC. Even though the program's open to the community currently, it's only the persons experiencing homelessness that are accessing that. So it, it is starting off well. We've got great successes already. We're excited about it. Can I ask a follow-up <coughs> question about the Resource Center? I, I get asked frequently what people, the public can do to aid and support, whether it's like volunteer, they, who can we reach out to, what are you guys looking for? So we do have a volunteer program um, at Diane Hoteling in, under my staff leadership is actually manages that. Um, you can see, connect through me or through her, um, through the, the internet. Um, I think we're all connected there. Just contact me. I'll give you my card before I leave. Um, and the other way is we have a partnership with Virginia Beach, uh, excuse me, VB Home Now, which is a foundation that was set up to help support ending homelessness in our city. 
Um, and they're, they have multiple events and ways that people, if they want to connect financially to us, can go through um, supporting us through that way. Great. Thank you. Sure. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great job. Thanks, Elizabeth, Thank for your you. work. All right. Good briefing, Andy. Thank you. Uh, informational in, in, in nature, but uh, something that we are engaged in across <clears throat> all our departments in the city. Very so nice. next, Danette Smith is coming in. Uh, she's going to give us a short briefing on SkillQuest, and she's also going to address seven uh, agenda items that you had a lot of... Uh, of uh, money coming in from federal and state sources and the requirements to uh, expend that require us to add some uh, staff to, to accomplish that mission. And she's going to address those at the end of her briefing, uh, hopefully answer most of your questions that you may have had uh, before you tackle the agenda this evening. So, Danette, good to see you. Good to and see team. you, too. All teams, big teams. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for having my team here. Uh, this evening I have with me who will be actually making the presentation for SkillQuest. It will be Eileen Smith, who's our Deputy Director of the Behavioral Health uh, Division. We also have with us today Laura Disney, who's one of my administrators. Tim Capaldo to the back, who's one of our administrators uh, over uh, our developmental services programs. And Dawn Reichardt, who will be working with me on any questions that you may have about the agenda items this afternoon, this evening. So I'm going to turn it over to Eileen to talk a little bit with you about SkillQuest. Uh, as you may be aware from the PowerPoint, we are making some programmatic uh, changes because the state is requiring us to. But we're also, as we're making those programmatic changes, we're looking for ways to enhance our services. And so, Eileen. Good evening, everyone. Hi. Welcome. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our SkillQuest program, which is under our Developmental Services Division. Uh, I am the Deputy Director of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services, which includes all of the mental health services, substance use, uh, developmental services, which is intellectual disabilities, as well as the prevention services. SkillQuest is an adult day program that's been a part of our city since 1991 or 1990. It was, it used to be called the Adult Day Program. Laura's very familiar with it. She's been with the city for a long time, and she's been the supervisor for several years now. The program started with 18 clients, and today it has a total of 148 clients and 55 city positions. The goal of the program is to provide an individual plan of care that includes community excursions, but also looks at the person independently. So we're looking at each individual to see what do they need to be able to live more independent lives. Uh, and tasks related to self-care. These pictures that you see in the PowerPoint are not actually our clients, but it's a good representation of some of the individuals that we work with. So SkillQuest supports individuals who are 21 years or older. They have 148 participants, as I just mentioned. About 111 of these have the Medicaid waiver. 36 reside in what's called an ICF or an in, uh, uh, intermediate care facility. We have four intermediate care facilities in the city. The participants have complicated physical, but they also have a lot of medical issues. They're very medically fragile. Some of these individuals, as you've seen, are in wheelchairs. Uh, they have G-tubes for feeding and, and um, very, very complicated medical issues that we take care of every day. So what is, why would we redesign SkillQuest? Well, SkillQuest is a program that's had a lot of attention from very, uh, stringent auditors, I would say, and over the last several years, they've looked at the way we're doing documentation, and they've looked at the way that we're able to show all the active care that we do. So we always are doing continuous quality improvement. We have a continuous quality improvement department in, our, uh, in the human services department, but for this reason, we wanted to see how we could not only enhance the services, as the director has said, and do a better job of providing those services, but also meet all the needs of every auditor that was coming in. And we've had probably six audits in the last three years. So the next page talks a little bit about medical necessity and what that means. And of course, it means a little bit more stringent documentation requirements. But it also means that your treatment plan goals are going to be more specific to skill enhancement. So you're going to be teaching people skills that they can use in their daily lives. 
you're going to document these and the manner that they want you to document the the active goals that you're working on is now daily. This is the key to what uh, the changes are in reality. When I first started with the department, which was only six years ago, we were doing monthly notes. Then we moved to weekly notes, and now we're on daily notes. So if you're doing daily notes for 148 people, it's a lot of notes each day. Okay. So that talks a little bit about that restructuring and a little bit about the um, differences. The other piece that we wanted to do here, which is on our additional proposed changes sheet, is we wanted to make sure that we could, <clears throat> as we make these changes, serve everyone to the best of our ability. So we went from two four-hour program days. So we had people coming in four hours in the morning, four hours in the afternoon, different people. So what we did was we shrunk that down to one six-hour day. I don't know of any other programs in the state, really, that were providing services the entire eight hours without documentation time built in for the staff. So now we're going to have documentation time built in. So it will be in the afternoon. So we'll, we'll run the program from 9.30 to 3.30. From 3.30 to 5.30 will be the staff time to do all of that work that they need to do. What have we done to do this? We have already met with families. We had 31 individual family meetings, and then we had a whole town hall last week. So at the town hall, we probably had 70 families that came, maybe 50, 50 to 70. They had very good questions, and some of the questions that they asked were, what if my child cannot be there for six hours? They've been used to a four-hour day. So what if they can't be there that ad additional two hours? And so we said we would work with everyone. Everyone who came in, we definitely will work with them on transportation and whether or not they can be there that long. Okay, so what are we going to have by the time this final restructuring is done? We're going to have 10 program rooms where we will have 10 clients in each room, and then the <clears throat> additional 48 individuals will be going out in the community. There's a big push with the waiver redesign over the last three years to get people out in the community. One of the issues that we've had with that a little bit is that the majority of our clients are in wheelchairs. So we do not have one staff to wheel three wheelchairs, for example. Um, it's really, that's how the ratio is, one to three, but it doesn't quite work out when you have people with uh, intense physical issues that have to be monitored out in the community. So we have a fair number that will be in, in the center, and then we'll have 48 that will be able to go out every day. We do not anticipate needing any more positions for this change. Again, we met with all the families and took into all their, their needs and their considerations into account. And we do not anticipate any financial differences in the program as we move forward. Any questions for me? Mr. Is Moss has a question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Is the reason for the daily monitoring, is there some output of graduating from this program? Is that the idea? Of you? I don't think that's the case, but you said daily monitoring and making progress. I know other federal programs, when progress stops being made, the service gets changed. Is that the case here, or is this just a continual service yeah. level? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, in other programs, you are exactly right, and that happens a lot in the mental health field where they want you to recover. They want you to gain those skills so that you can be independent, get a job, do these type of things. The clientele that we have are gaining skills in like self-care, but some of these individuals do not speak. They are unable to um, eat or talk or any of this. And so they are gaining in small amounts. And what they're looking for is active treatment. So they don't want an individual coming into the center and sleeping. They want an individual participating in what we're doing. And Laura has been designing some additional social activities within the program and also without of the program because of the DOJ requirements. I think that's great. Thank you so much. Mr. Wood. So two questions. One, when I went and visited SkillQuest was several years ago, it seemed to me there was a vocational component. Is that still... Well, the vocational component, that one I am going to need your help on because that's a little bit more on the, on the beach house side. Well, it wasn't beach house. It was, it, was at, it was located at SkillQuest, and they were doing something with uh, what, some of the electronics companies. We do uh, have a, yeah, a pre-vocational part of Medicaid. Will you stand oh, up so, so they can hear you on the mic? I don't feel important this is, Laura, this is Laura Disney. <laughs> Hi, guys. The pre-vocational <laughs> component of the Medicaid waiver under the, the Medicaid redesign is no longer a service. Okay. So it's no longer a reimbursable service. 
Okay. So that, that is gone. They want everyone now to be gainfully employed, if possible. Okay, and then my next question is, you talked about all the audits. Who is doing these audits? The Department of Medicaid Services, or DMAS, and also our DBHDS, which is the Department of Behavioral Health Developmental Services. We have a lot of acronyms. And their licensure program was coming out. They license us for this program, for day support. I mean, is this an inordinate number of audits, or do a lot of programs get this? It seems like... That, that's quite a few. Actually, we have audits weekly, almost. No, so that's not really a lot of audits. And our auditor, she likes to come in October and come to our art show. She really enjoys it. Yeah, so she has come frequently, but also she has worked with them on the changes. So when we went from monthly to weekly, she was helping them with that. And they were more technical audits to assist us in, in gaining what we needed to. Ms. Abbott. Potter. I have a question about the as far as what Skill, Skill Quest does. How do we work in conjunction with the private contractors that are offering like the day support services? My husband worked for one years ago, and the individual he worked with was almost he didn't. I mean, he received services from the city, but not very many. So, is there an overlapping? I mean, I know that their their struggle on the private side was. They, they could not get people out in the community even though they really wanted to see, which I think is a great, I ho I'm very hopeful that that will be something we're able to execute. Well, for example, many of the private providers have gone to, uh, well, first of all, they have a different clientele. That's okay. a very important piece of this. The clientele that we have, again, are in wheelchairs, whereas a lot of their clientele right. are able to ambulate. They're able to get along out in the community. They are able to do that one to three ratio mm -hmm. without any problems. They can go to the restroom, this type of thing. So a lot of them have bought vans mm -hmm. to help with this and have moved their service right out of the center. Right. And again, it's a different clientele. We do need that center for the, the individuals that we have. They can't go out when it's super hot. They right. can't go out when it's very, very cold. So the, the skills that we're working on primarily aren't necessarily to make them an independent, like be able to live independently, primarily just to improve quality of life and, and, exactly. and overall health. Um, and then... So none of, these, none of these individuals are anticipated to live independently at any point. No. Okay. Many of them live in an ICF or okay. they live with their families. Right. And their fam some of their families even drop them off. We talked with them about that last week as to how they were going to do that with work. Um, if you've ever visited one of our intermediate care facilities, it, this is a very similar population that is coming. And it is getting a little bit more of that socialization that they need and learning some skills that will help them. That's awesome. I appreciate everything you guys are doing. That's really great. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank we'll you. Move. So I'm going to ask Danette just to <coughs> get a couple of charts. Yeah. A couple. Yep. They're going to fire through these agenda items real quick just to, I figured it made sense since I had so, her in the room. Um, in your agenda item, I'm requesting uh, for Ordinance 8 that you allow the department to transfer approximately $809,000. And this is to help us with uh, meeting some state mandates. And let me just go over those mandates. I won't go through the number of positions. But one, we're trying to make sure that we transfer funds to meet our outcomes for adult uh, outpatient clinic. As many of you know, we're under the same day access where when a uh, consumer presents themselves for mental health services, we must be able to provide that service the day that they show up in the office. It's the days of waiting 30 days for an appointment. The state doesn't allow us to do that and we're going to need staff. The second thing is that we wanted to redistribute some money that would allow us to cover some of our administrative support. Most of my administrators at Laura and Tim Capaldo are doing their clerical support themselves. And so we were trying to move around some clerical support to give them some bandwidth to not only uh, work with their staff, but to be able to lead and not be uh, hampered by just clerical functions. And then finally, adult protective services. We are re-engineering our adult protective services. Currently, our adult protective services area has very high caseloads. We're looking at how we can decrease those caseloads. But in order to be able to do that, we're going to need some additional hands and supervision to do that. And so we're asking to be able to transfer monies to these various programs. And then finally, to Tim's program, where we are 
uh, working with persons who have intellectual and developmental disabilities in our uh, intermediate care facilities, we want to be able to retool and staff that as appropriate. You'll notice on that slide requires no additional general fund. The next slide is Ordinance 9, and there we are preparing for several different programs. So we're looking at FAD, um, DBHDS, as well as CSA, and I want to go through this very quickly. The 555,000. Yeah, so oh, okay. Get it again okay. Am, I, am I yeah, hitting it over and over? Sorry. You're wilding this out. Oh, yeah. am I? Sorry about oh, that. I got you. Okay. I All right. Um, some people can't talk and click at the same time, you. and that's me. I got you, Dan. Um, right so the $555,000 is to address Medicaid expansion. Many of you know that we will begin Medicaid expansion on the social service side beginning uh, January of 2019. The state has been able to provide us with some monies for some staff uh, positions and so we are asking to be able to use that money toward Medicaid expansion. You will notice that throughout the state there are going to be a creation of 300 additional new uh, positions. We are thinking that we're going to be seeing an increase in 700 and 50 to 760 new applications on the front end. These positions are going to allow us to deal not only with the new applications coming in on the front end, both paper and electronic, but also to be able to manage the case on the back end. Uh, not requiring at this time additional uh, general fund, but there will be a 15.5 uh, match uh, in the years moving forward. The Before, next. Can you just Mr. Wood has a question. On this one before you go to the next one. So the, the last two bullets requires no additional general fund support, but then you say 15.5% local match required in out years. So what's the source of that fund, those funds? That's going to be state funds, right? Right. Dawn? So it's going to be passed through state funds yeah. for a local match? No, no, no local it's going to be our match. Local match. Yeah. From, I mean, yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. Our, so we're asking in this, when we're doing this, we're asking in this year, no additional general fund support. But next year, for the so 86,000 or so. Right. It'll be in our 2020 um, operating budget request. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So for CSA, and I know that uh, you remember um, the CSA <laughs> Uh, issues in the past. Uh, we're asking for one position there to be authorized um, to do some strengthening and some infrastructure in that area. We're looking to hire a utilization review person as well as looking at ways to improve our Harmony uh, system that does all of our PO's purchase orders. Uh, for us, and we're wanting to expand the capacity of that system so that we have real-time information about how we're contracting with some of the contractors. You'll remember in the past we've had some problems with uh, utilizing contracts appropriately and developing those co contracts appropriately. We want to be able to use some additional funds for the allocation to improve on that system, as well as you'll remember that we were in need of a utilization person who would actually review the work of our CSA uh, administrator, and we'd like to take those additional funds and hire a utilization uh, person. Finally, under 9C, we're asking for your authorization of four positions for our Part C infant program. Our infant program provides a lot of services to um, <clears throat> children from zero to about five years old, three years old, and those services range from case management to assessment, speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, both in the home and also at our center base. We are serving close to 700 children here in Virginia. Beach, and we, are, we were able to get additional dollars, and so we'd like to be able to have you authorize us to get four additional positions to be able to serve the volume that, we're currently, that we currently have. On page five, we are, again, trying to meet the uh, goals of uh, the state by uh, beefing up our same-day access for mental health services. Um, you may have read, or I know we've talked about it in here, about STEP VA, and that's an initiative 
uh, around making sure that we are seeing people who have mental illness, severe mental illness, in a timely manner that is has caused Eileen and her staff to retool their outpatient clinic to make sure that we are able to serve people expeditiously. So we're asking for support to authorize five positions. We're also looking at the possibility of retooling what is a group room into office space so that we have more intake rooms where people can be seen. Right now, we have people waiting in the waiting room to be seen in about two or three offices, and we'd like to retool those offices to be able to see more people. The $63,000 is for one position. This is an opportunity that we have. We serve as the regional convener for the Kinship Navigator Program, and this is where we're going to have one staff person, perhaps contract, who will be working with people who are non-relatives to help the fit of kin have uh, support in the community. We see a lot of grandparents who are raising their grandchildren, and the Kinship Navigator position would help those um, grandparents be able to utilize resources in the community to better support the kids in their care. And so that's what the authorization is about for the 63000 And then finally, we have three things that are located there for the $306,000. There's money for our adoption system. Uh, a new data tracking system on the mental health side because of all the transformation that is going on at the state. The state has required us to um, buy a system called Service Progress Quality Management where they are tracking all of the services that we say that we are providing, but not only the number of services, the outputs and the quality of the services that we are providing. And this is sponsored through the state. And then also to use pass-through dollars for ongoing prevention and treatment programs. Again, no additional general fund. Yes, Mr. Boss. At a later date, I'd like you to provide more detail on what that forty-five thousand dollars is. Absolutely. And what percentage of the demographic of zero to three does seven hundred and seventy infants are sub three represent? You can mm -hmm. answer that at a later date. I'd like to know what percentage okay. of the demographic population that represents. We, sh Thank we can you. certainly give you that. Thanks, Danette. Thank you. Eileen, good Thank brief. You. Thanks. And so, members of council, uh, our last item today is something in the water. And so, uh, following a second meeting with uh, Pharrell Williams and his uh, festival delivery team uh, and uh, several, four members of our city council, uh, we thought it wise that we bring it to all the members of council uh, an idea, an initiative that could uh, potentially uh, put us on the map for the place in the world of technology, <coughs> art, fashion, food, music, and at a time where we are looking and searching for something better than we currently have. And so I've asked Deputy City Manager Ron Williams to present this concept. Mayor, members of council, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, we had the opportunity uh, to receive uh, a briefing uh, for this opportunity uh, to come to Virginia Beach. Uh, we have since uh, shared uh, the highlights of, of that I'm sharing with you this evening uh, to the Resort Advisory Commission and also the Human Rights Commission, both of which uh, have endorsed the concept. Uh, and this evening, uh, we're asking for your consensus as we work with the operator uh, to bring this to reality. Uh, Pharrell Williams, uh, we all know him. Uh, we've all uh, looked for opportunity for him to be engaged, and this is something that he saw from afar uh, that, based on his experience and based on, uh, frankly, that, that we've had some challenges and even a struggle in, with College Beach Week or Week 17 in April, and he felt that what he had in mind uh, was uh, a good fit, and so far we, we are seeing that. Uh, this is his quote, yeah, open with that. The slides I'm sharing are some of the highlights of what they shared with us. Um, and so he's learned so much and he's very proud of Virginia Beach uh, and the opportunities uh, that, that we have to offer. Pharrell noticed uh, that not only are we, are we an area rich with water and the opportunities and challenges it presents, but that often that the talent, whether they be uh, music artists or sports uh, athletes, uh, that when they're interviewed, uh, the interviewer often said there must be something in the water about, about where all this talent is coming from. And so that really stuck with him. Uh, and as he said, it's undeniable. 
Uh, and he, he knew that that was so special about that and what it means for us that he decided to trademark it and he wants to keep it for Virginia Beach. So what he's suggesting is that we create something that is our, our own gathering, but it's on the par of uh, South by Southwest, which has really matured as an event for Austin. Uh, it is an uh, uh, intervention of product launches, festival, music, uh, and conference style event. Um, and so where he sees is that there are young people who could meet with business and culture, pushing it forward, a uh, combination of music, food, sports, technology, uh, and what's on the emerging uh, trends of anything in those realms. Um, and that perhaps somebody's introduced not only an idea, perhaps a job, or even uh, their own inspiration for creating their own business. And so he's, he's dubbed this to Something in the Water Festival. Uh, as I mentioned, he trademarked it. And he uh, has proposed that this be uh, again in the last week of April, that it be at the waterfront, at the oceanfront, uh, but the hub of it is at the convention center. Uh, again, with content being a significant amount of a conference style event, where you might see the CEO of Netflix, uh, a brand partner of his, where you might see a mathematician, uh, or you might see a TV or mo a movie uh, artist that sharing some of their experience or their inspiration. His team has worked on a similar, uh, a similar event in Long Beach over the past three years. It's called Complex Con. Uh, and to give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the content that they had there this past weekend, um, Women Behind the Film was one of the panel discussions. How to make business in America. Uh, and then sometimes dicing it up within the culture of what might interest people that are going to that. Complex happens to be a magazine for sneakerheads. Um, they, they had a, a discussion about who had the most influence on the industry, Michael Jordan or Alan Iverson. Um, and so it's, a, it's an idea where it's multicultural, it's multifaceted, it's not one thing, and it's not one thing that we've ever seen here before. And it's definitely on next level as far as an event that we have ever seen in Hampton Roads. This is his, this team. Uh, everyone uh, there on, on the top line, uh, Pharrell included, are basically the vision and the investors behind the event. And then the operators, including uh, Donna McMillan Whitaker, who you will recognize from Venture Realty, uh, and Leo Nitzberg, uh, point out here with BWG Live. And if you look at BWG's uh, website, that will give you the sense of their capacity and their talent and their reach uh, for putting together high quality festivals. So they're the operations team. Leo was here uh, today and we had a several hour uh, session from a technical perspective of trying to understand what they're trying to do um, and where they'd like to do it. Um, and so essentially we are in the pre-permit phase. Uh, this would be a permitted event uh, through our uh, special events office of uh, the CVB. Um, and again, the venues are classic stages that we might understand for any of the performances, and that might not be just music, it might be film uh, reviews, it may also be uh, a speaker. Uh, and then the convention center, uh, a portion of that uh, for the conference portion. We have some other bookings of a portion of the conference center that start on Sunday of this uh, three-day event. Um, and, but uh, in the future, if, the, if this moves forward, uh, <coughs> the dates that we see out in the future, they could likely book the, the, the complete convention center. Uh, so this is something in the water to get a sense of it. If you, if you want to do some more research, I would encourage you to look at the upcoming South by Southwest uh, event uh, in March, uh, where you'll often see product launches. Um, but you look at the t content there, there's even one for state and local government uh, and the issues that we're dealing with. Um, so his team uh, often describes the music as kind of the noise aspect. Um, he wants it to be very content rich. Uh, and it's an interesting blending of what they're proposing of adding the sports element in there uh, with perhaps a three on three basketball tournament. Um, but it, again, it's meant to be multicultural, multifaceted, um, and we see it as a, as a great opportunity to change uh, that time of year in April um, with even um, potential for local partners, for nonprofit participation, um, and to re really establish ourselves as a destination and in that space like some of these others uh, that you often hear, whether it's Coachella or Bonnaroo or South by Southwest or even now Complex Con, that, which uh, last year had 28,000 attendees and $5 million in sales in their retail uh, outlets in the, in the uh, Long Beach Center. Uh, it's grown this past weekend as well. So um, 
we have um, regular contact with the team and trying to get them to flesh out exactly what they're doing. We believe they need about another four to five weeks to get a, a real uh, thumbnail sketch of the complete agenda uh, with probably a launch in January of actually uh, what the full agenda is that they could bring to you and who the talent uh, and partners would be. Uh, last thing I'll say is that Pharrell is a serious uh, brand in himself and his relationships. He has a, uh, a brand partnership com company called I Am Other, and they are part of the leadership team as this as well. Uh, his key strategic partners include Apple, American Express, uh, and Adidas, um, and they are fully engaged in the conversation about this opportunity. Any questions? Yes, Mr. Wood. So would this be a ticketed event? Yes, sir. Ticketed. For, for everything? For everything. Do we have an idea of the price point? I, I'm just because there's going to be the, the students are going to come no matter what, and is this going to be something they can afford? We've had that conversation, and uh, they have different strategies for that. Um, and they're looking at uh, opportunities for just a single event or single day, and then definitely for the whole weekend. Uh, lots of VIP packages as well. All right. Thank you very much. Are, are we going to get more details on this? or Because, I mean, it's there, there's not a whole lot of... And this is just concept for now. There, are, there should be more stuff coming down the line. You know, as they finalize the plan, I assume, correct? Uh, yeah. Yes, I, sir. Let me let me jump in here. Um, uh, I attended a two-hour sit down with Pharrell, and I took Ken Chandler with me to that meeting, and and I entered that conversation thinking a festival was this. And in our conversation, Pharrell explained to me how a festival is really this. And the center of gravity for this festival takes place in the convention center. It's about content. It's about technology. It's about things that people go to see what is trending to become a part of something uh, that might hold a future for those in attendance where they have an opportunity to, to see where audio visual and movie making and maybe other aspects of that world would provide an opportunity for them as they go about trying to figure out what to do in college and come out on the other end of it. Uh, as Ron said, the music is just the noise. It's not the focus, which was different when I said festival to you, you all probably gravitated the same world I came from. And it's a different kind of an aspect. And so they've got uh, financing, they've got branding, they've got committed uh, participants, and they've seen what has grown in California. Uh, what, were the, what were the increases? 15 and 28 and then they just they don't have the final count from last just week. had it last weekend so we're waiting to see what those are so it's a different perspective with your new sports center uh, they're looking at a uh, a three-on-three -three basketball tournament that may may be uh, 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 celebrities uh, that kind of gets it off and kind of and we're looking at how do we help them uh, crawl, walk, run, like we did with the Patriotic Festival, like we've done with the American Music Festival, to, to create success that breeds success to where college kids are saying, yeah, I got my $400 all events, all attendance, everything package, where parents actually don't fear sending their kids to college break, but they say, yeah, we want you to go to something in the water, Virginia Beach, April 2019, be there because that's where it happened. And, and people come to be exposed to a new cultural transformation of what's trending in the world today. I mean, it's, it's really exciting. I just worry it's six months from now, which... They're rolling. They, he rolled in at the first meeting. Pharrell and I's conversation is, I think it's doable, but you got to deliver. And he came back, and Mr. Dyer, Mr. Davenport, uh, uh... I had uh, John, uh, John Earn and, and Shannon Kane. Uh, we had to have two different sessions, and he stayed with his team, both, both uh, two hours apiece. He delayed his flight back out to his recording session in L.A. just so he would present to at least two. Would have loved to get you all in here, but we have uh, we've taken on the mantra of making this presentation, and 
more to come. We just want you to know what's going on out there. That's why all these guys with the TV cameras are in here today, even though I think it's all about stormwater, right, guys? But the real reality is they're here to hear that you all, uh, to look for those vertical nods that you want us to continue to pursue this. And that's what we're asking for today. Wait, wait, hold on. Ms. Abbott first. So I, I really I love the idea. I've participated in, in events like this and attended them personally. I think the question that I think we'll all have is what are, what are they asking for aside from our vertical yes we'd like to we'd like you to come and do this what is that going to look like as far as our financial commitment I know that's the questions I keep getting asked especially when it comes to emergency services you get 28,000 people at the ocean yeah field. let me that jump. would be unreal Jessica let me let me <clears throat> jump on that we're all in on college beach weekend I don't have a spare police officer, I don't have a spare firefighter, I don't have a spare EMS technician, I got volunteers, I got public works. I'm all in on that beach weekend. Which is what I'm worried about. Well, I'm all in now. I love the idea of doing this. I think this is a positive change, but what, it, what are we going to do to gear up to make sure we have the staff to be able to respond to this? Not only in do... In a great way. Uh, we, we have the staff to organize it and support them, but they're also going to be bringing a, a contingent of security okay. and control. And they're going to use smart flown apps to tell people, and they're going to use a, a dispersed environment where... There's a comedian on this stage working, and down here there's some music going on here, and there's maybe a professional engaging conversation going on here, and at the convention center or across the street might be a tournament going, and it'll be ongoing in multiple places. Right. Uh, well, the, and 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 I and I th I have no doubt that an operator like this couldn't wouldn't have the technology to do that. I think what I was trying to say is. I think there is the feedback I've gotten from what has been already publicized is that people want to see that that week be positive for the community, and but they're concerned about, like I said, our dollar commitment in terms of I, I just I haven't heard anything about that. That's what I'm interested in. I'm excited and supportive, but I, I, I'm eager to hear the details. So I guess when will we know that information? All right. Ms. Wilson, did you have something? Oh. Dave, can I answer that though? Well, I'll, well Dave, can I? Dave, so go ahead. Like, so we're we're working with the understanding of, of how how do you make this happen? It's basically a, any an operator can come in and work and submit a permit to have an event. Right. And so they and until they have an understanding that there might be a thumbs up, they haven't booked any talent or or That's or set enough. an agenda. I just was curious. Um, they haven't asked specifically for any direct payment from the city and said in fact they wouldn't request that. Okay. Um, so as they flesh out the agenda and we keep this permit in draft form over the next four weeks or so, then we'll start to understand what is there a direct impact that we uh, have to have a conversation about. Perfect. Thank you. I think it's an amazing opportunity and it's also going to fill the hotel rooms at a time when they're not normally filled. This is kind of a weird thing to think about, and it probably can't happen this time. But since it's also an educational opportunity for College Beach Weekend, <clears throat> looking forward in the future, is there any way we can work with the colleges and universities for some type of a college credit or through create, you know, through the arts or anything like that, just to kind of throw that idea mm -hmm. out there? We'll share that idea. When well, you were saying how parents are going to be so excited about paying $400 when their kids are going to be able to enjoy all of this stuff, but yet it's going to be, they're going to be receiving a lot in return for it. Just, just uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, to Jim's point, that, you know, sitting at that table, I was really impressed with the knowledge and expertise of the pros that were there. These are, you know, these are icons in the entertainment business that have done this before. And, you know, I was remarkably impressed with their knowledge and organization. And you know, they're talking about, you know, they were throwing names like Beyonce and, you know, they were th some heavy-duty names out there. And I think the other thing is, too, that they want to keep it going. This is not, I don't believe, a one-term event. And the other thing I took away from it, I did ask a question, would this be a, a, a possible way to get the template and have these type of events on other weekends also and really help change the culture at the oceanfront and start getting, you know, people from 757 and other parts of Virginia Beach, you know, enjoying it too. So there is that opportunity 
that this could actually mushroom into beyond the one week thing that I think would be a tangible benefit for everybody. Well, it sounds very exciting. So unless we say no to them, they'll be prepared to come back to you in realistically in January and, and, and show you what they'd like to do. I'm sure we want them to come back. Yes, okay. absolutely. Yes, so. yes sir. Yeah. Two thumbs up. Very good. <laughs> All right. We, Cisco and Ebert. We we're, really, we're really running out of time. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, thanks for engaging us today. Okay. Are there any council liaison reports? If not, any council comments? I do have just one kind of a question. In reading uh, this weekend about the, you know, we know that the Veterans Care Center has been delayed for some reason, and I think the article that's in the newspaper gave some really good reasons for it. But we are doing the road project to get to the uh, entrance way. And since they've been delayed until, it, what did it say, that the uh, <coughs> real construction was probably going to begin late summer, but we're supposed to be beginning this road project in January, I think, from the last briefing I got. I hope we'll go ahead and do that, and that would avoid our having to do the temporary entranceway from North Landon Road. Uh, so I hope just because it's been delayed, we don't delay the road project. I think there's a great advantage to going ahead and doing our road project at the right time and having it done so we don't have to do that temporary access off of North Landon. Okay. Yes, Mr. Mr. Moss. I may just be right? brief. I mentioned this earlier to the mayor, but the Congress will be reorganizing in January. Bobby Scott's going to be the chairman of the committee that takes care of training and workforce development. I know we're working on that regional idea for a training center for the sport and maritime industry. <coughs> People need to be taking note of that and engaging uh, him in advance of January 3rd so we can kind of have those cooperations because he'll be the key place to help us. And even though Whitman won't be the chairman, he'll be the ranking member of the subcommittee on sea power, and his good friend is uh, Congressman Courtney from Groton, Connecticut. So I think the timing is right to make something happen there, so I hope the regional is people are working on that item. Ms. Abbott? Very quickly, this weekend, um, myself and Jimmy Wood, Jim's son, um, and I had remarks at the for the highway marker, um, the skirmish of Kemp's Landing. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, it's at Emanuel Episcopal, or right in front of Emanuel Episcopal on Witch Duck and Princess Anne. Um, it was really cool. Uh, Christopher Pazinski did all the, the research for the grant to get that marker placed, and I think uh, if you've got a minute to go by and check it out. Um, it was also the site of the first Virginian casualty in the Revolutionary War, so very interesting. All right, can we do the agenda real quick, Mr. Yes, Wood? Okay. Um, <clears throat> under ordinances, <laughs> resolutions, um, let me just tell you all, item I-1, I-3 are both um, going to be heard. I understand Mr. Moss is voting no on I-4 and I-6. Are there any other? Yes, ma'am. I have, I have, a, well, we're only, we're not planning. You've got an abstention, right? Yes. I've got that. Yes. So any, any other comments under ordinances resolution? Okay. So and nothing, nothing here. Okay. All right. Under planning, item J-1, Bichard Homes, LLC, variance section 4.4, .4, district 5, Lynn Haven. I'm okay with that, Ms. Abbott. You're abstaining on this one, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, J2, FWM Residential Rental Properties, LLC, for a variance to Section 4.4B of Subdivision, 425 Old Great Neck Road, District 6 Beach. Mr. Ernst not here. Does anybody have an issue with that? Uh, number three, Kerbor LLC for variance to Section 4.4B. Subdivision regulations rate lot with 3716 West Neck Road, Princess Anne. I'm really wrestling with this one because I know it's in an area that's got some flood prone capabilities, and I really worry about the size of the lots, the houses that are proposed to be put there. Um, for a week so I can look at it some more and find out what, how much flooding was on that lot. But if you all want to go ahead, you can, and I'll just vote no. I'll support your deferral. I'd like to see. I'd like to see the flood analysis myself. All right. So it's going to be consent for deferral to November twentieth, eleven twenty. Okay. And, and somebody will notify the applicant if they're there outside. Okay. 
uh, item four, uh, 27th and a half Street Garage LLC, 27th Street Hotel Associates LLC, uh, special exception for alternative compliance to Ocean Front Resort District form based code. And that's 203 27th Street, 2701 Pacific Avenue Beach District. There was an alternate plan. Do we have that that will be included in? Yes, sir. Is that somewhere? Provided you right. Property. Okay. So, so we'll just say this is going to be consent the for the for the alternate plan. Is everybody okay with that? Good look at it. Is this a question? Is? Can we get another copy of it? Sir, thank you. That would be the question. It should be in the package. It should be in here. It, it's in the packet. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I think we just got today. Okay. okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. Okay. Item five. Damn next. That that's on consent. Yeah, I was on consent with the alternate plan unless anybody has an issue with it. Item 5, Damn Neck Storage Partners LLC, modification of proffers to conditional change of zoning and modification of conditions for storage container size. And uh, this is District 7, Princess Anne. The applicants requested a deferral to November 20th. Uh, yeah, that's fine. I'm glad of that because uh, I was confused in reading it. I hope you all... Uh, Maybe I think we have a, speakers on this one. So I, I, my concern is, is a week long enough to resolve all the issues in light of the comments? Maybe it isn't or isn't. Well, I had a briefing at 2.30, which answered a lot of things for me. But I just was having trouble <coughs> finding all that transcript with what yes. we were given. So maybe we can... Um, I'll trust you. If, you, if you're no, comfortable, I'm comfortable. No. Well, do you want to do it? Well, I mean, we're going to hear it anyway because okay, they're speakers. Okay, so well, you can I make a motion for however it, you want to okay, defer it or indefinite deferral right. or whatever. Item six, Tanya Mitchells and Bo Wang for conditional use permit, family daycare, 1501 Three Gate Trail, District 3, Roseville. Ms. Kane notified me she was okay with it. She said there was a letter of opposition, but there has been no opposition present at planning. I don't think anybody signed up, so... Everybody okay with that? Okay, one, one question also, housekeeping item. The clerk has asked me January 1st is um, is a Tuesday, so your suggestion is? My question is January 8th, do we want to have a formal session on January 8th, which is normally just a workshop? I think we need to That's going to be with all the new people, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Mm -hmm. We need to do an ordinance to do that. Yes, we can I do that this week. Yeah. That's why yeah. she's asking. Uh, us, yeah, okay. we would like we did for. Right, okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Not at all. No, good. Okay. The chair will entertain a motion to recess into closed session pursuant to the exemption from open meetings allowed by Section 2.2-3711A, Code of Virginia, as amended for the following purposes legal matters, consultation with legal counsel, employed and retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel pursuant to section 2.2-3711A7 City Council transition, uh, personnel matters, discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers appointees or employees of any public body pursuant to section 2.2-3711A1, council appointments, council boards, commissions, committees, authorities, agencies, and appointees. So moved. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Henley? Aye. Mr. Dyer? Aye. Mr. Moss? Aye. Mr. Davenport? Aye. Ms. Abbott? Aye. Ms. Kane, Mr. Arnold, absent Ms. Wilson? Aye. Ms. Wilson? Aye.